So our next speaker is Levi Garraway uh, from the Broad Institute in the Farber. Um, so he's going to talk on the use of emerging technologies, which is very important to predict tumor response and drug resistance. Levi. Well, it's an honor to be here, although it's a misfortune to have to follow uh, the sweeping inspirational talk of Jose Bazelga and the blend of cool science and comedy that we just heard. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, we have to live with the carbs that we're dealt in life. And uh, since mine is the last talk before the closing re remarks, I thought that it might be useful to give a talk that is uh, the beginnings of a synthesis of the many observations and concepts that you've heard during the course of the day, but also hopefully uh, beginning to articulate a view of what hopefully uh, the, f the field is going to look like in the future if we can do this uh, so these are the learning objectives, which I forgot that I wrote. But um, so let me just begin by, by uh, point number one, which you've already heard, which, it, which is clearly uh, the genomic basis of cancer is crucial for uh, our movement forward in translational oncology. And there are three major categories of genetic alterations that you heard about this morning, and I'll just resummarize them for you again. The first category is point mutations, which can either turn cancer genes on or turn them off. The second category is copy number alterations within the chromosome, which will either amplify oncogenes, a la ERB2, a la MET, uh, or delete them, a la P10, et cetera. The third category is translocations, structural rearrangements that either generate chimeric gene uh, fusions, BCR ABLE, EML4 ALK, or otherwise dysregulate uh, cancer genes, such as et factors in uh, prostate cancer, in a way that drive cancer. So it's really these three categories of alterations that we have to be able to, in some systematic fashion, get our uh, brains and uh, hands around, if you will, uh, in terms of getting smart. And this is the reason we say this. It's not just an intellectual exercise. It is the, uh, a, a paradigm shift in the field, which arguably uh, Bruce could probably comment on this better than me, it might be the largest since the advent of chemotherapy in the first place. The, the, the shift of not just being empirical in our treatment of cancer based on the anatomic origin, but rather moving towards uh, an era where the genetics take an equal, if not a superior seat at the table because of two cardinal factors. One is the, and I've just obviously listed a few examples, but the dizzying number of targeted therapeutic agents that are now emerging, which in principle give us the ability to extinguish uh, many of these uh, crucial pathways that you've been hearing about. So, that's the, it, so it's the proliferation of targeted agents together with the knowledge of the importance of genetics. And, uh, and this will be the major focus of my talk, it is the advancement of technology the ability in principle to take any patient who comes to the door and read out the salient genetic alterations in a manner that will specify the use of, these, of such agents. So we can therefore articulate a vision to personalize cancer medicine, not to overuse the term, where each patient will come in at the time of biopsy or, uh, or uh, as a result of some procedure, the genetic material will be extracted uh, and what will be gleaned is a matrix of salient genetic alterations uh, together with uh, available targeted agents. And so the notion is that if a patient comes in, regardless of where in the body their tumor has occurred, and they are found to have a mutation that might predict responsiveness uh, to a, a targeted agent, this patient who may, uh, have, uh, who may either have already failed standard of care or will uh, be anticipated to fail standard cytotoxics, ought to be given a shot at, at such an agent, even if even in instances where uh, it's not part of the label, et cetera. So this is the notion uh, that we are all moving towards. So, and it's, it's a compelling notion. But there are a whole series of questions that lie beneath the notion. And it's easy to sort of talk about genotyping everybody, uh, but I just want to unpack some of these issues and lay them out as challenges, but also as opportunities for translational research and, and also uh, thoughtful, uh, clinical trials going forward. And the answers are not clear to all of us, but, but, but it's clear that we need to be thinking about this. So one question is, which technology, which platform should we use to genotype patients? I actually don't like the term genotype, uh, but I'll uh, speak to why I don't like that in, in a few minutes. But one of the observations that uh, has led to the first generation of personalized medicine 
was the recognition that for the typical oncogene point mutation, the spectrum of mutations that occur are not random. So here are three examples. One could give many more. In RAS, there are three codons, codons 12, 13, and 61, that easily account for 99 percent of all RAS mutations in cancer. Similarly, BRAF, really codon 600 in melanoma is, is the most important, but there are another couple of dozen or so that easily account for almost all of the BRAF mutations you see. PIK3, CA, it's the same kind of thing. A couple of dozen mutations, 80 plus percent of incidence. So what that means is that for, for, from a first approximation, genotyping was an appropriate term because this reduced the problem from having to sequence a whole bunch of genes in every patient at a time when it was still prohib prohibitively expensive to do so to a genotyping question where, uh, the, uh, where one could cobble together assays that read out those salient, highly recurrent point mutations in the most low-hanging fruit of oncogenes and, uh, and could uh, achieve quite a robust set of information. And so this is a summary of work that's come out of our group, but of course there's uh, similar work that's been done here at M uh, MGH uh, with Snapshot, which basically finds a couple of points. First, when you take thousands of cancers now uh, and you take a list of several hundred uh, assay, genotyping assays for oncogene point mutations or cancer gene point mutations, you can see sort of two patterns, there are the mountains and the hills. The mountains are the, the, the peaks of frequency uh, of particular gene mutations and particular cancer types that we already know about, the EGFR and lung cancer, the BRAF and melanoma. But the hills are what really got us excited early on. The hills are the presence of, of plausibly druggable or actionable mutations that, are, that occur in cancer contexts where you wouldn't normally look for them. But they, if you knew about them, they might be game changers, at least in terms of an option that you could give to a patient that you otherwise can't give. So th it was this notion that if you could cobble together a way of reading out the salient genetic information in a robust and cost-effective manner that one ought to be able to do good in terms of patient stratification, uh, designing smarter clinical trials, and just generally giving more patients the opportunity to benefit from targeted agents, and conversely, uh, avoiding the use of targeted agents where uh, they might be predicted to fail. So for example, if you saw RAS mutations and you might have been thinking about giving an EGFR inhibitor, uh, even though it's not lung cancer, you might still think twice about doing so. So it's this notion that's, given, that, that's gotten us started at many cancer centers in terms of uh, bringing in a technology that can enable personalized medicine. But although the technology has gotten us started, it is clearly insufficient to get us to the finish line. So this is why I'm not in love with the notation, the, the genotyping is the term. Because what we really need to do uh, at the end of the day, in, in light of what I told you at the beginning of the, the major categories of genetic alterations, each of which has been shown to enact druggable uh, alterations, we need to go a lot further. Now one is purely a technical issue. In the real world, it's not sufficient uh, to just uh, to have an assay that is, uh, that has, that's constrained by uh, sensitivity and breadth of only the highly recurrent mutation. We need to be very sensitive and specific and arguably go quite deep. So uh, the, the, the mention of the, the heterogeneity of tumors and the fact that mutations can exist in subsets uh, and just in general the stromal admixture, we need to be able to go uh, quite deep to read out the, the, the information. We can't stop at the low-hanging fruit oncogene mutations. We need to go into tumor suppressors. We need to be able to find P10 deletions and, and, uh, and loss of function mutations, NF1 loss of function mutations, the, the kinds of things that we know are just as decisive in dialing up the pathways as are the oncogenes, but we don't look for them now because we can't. So we need to get better than that. We need to read out the multiple, the, the multiplicity of alterations, the amplifications, deletions, and translocations. We need to read all of that out in one fell swoop because we know the, the, the emerging data suggests that just like the hills and mountains that I showed earlier, there are the similar patterns uh, in terms of alterations and amplifications that are distributed across cancer. We need to be able to read those out as well. And we need to apply this in the real world. We need to uh, make sure that it's working robustly in, uh, in the clinic with uh, appropriate turnaround time, et cetera. So that's what the world needs to look like at the end. And so now the question is how are we going to get there? So, Anybody who's been following genomics technology over the past several years can easily uh, recognize that massively parallel sequencing is an excellent candidate as a technology platform that could get us to the promised land, if you will. And, the, and in fact, 
I, I've been to several meetings now where I've heard people make these comments that, oh, you know, in a couple of years, we'll just be sequencing the genome of everybody's cancer, and it'll be a point of care test. We'll just have the information in the patient's medical record. That's as though it's a foregone conclusion that massive parallel sequencing and sequencing the entire cancer genome is where we're going to be in a couple of years. And in fact, I've had patients call me to ask, can I get my genome sequenced? And where can I get it sequenced? And why can't I get it sequenced? So the argument uh, for this is actually quite compelling on paper. The technology and the rate of expansion and, the, and, and what's possible ha continues to make great leaps. So currently, if one wants to sequence the entire genome, the uh, target coverage is about 30-fold deep in the cancer uh, and 30-fold deep in the matched normal. That allows you to call the mutations with appropriate confidence. The existing instrument or the, or the, uh, the sort of current generation instrument uh, yields about five uh, gigabases of, of genome sequence per day, but the new one that's just been installed uh, ups that to about 30 gigabases of sequence per day, and since the human genome is about three gigabases, it's already a 10x just in one day. So the massive expansion of the capacity of technology is one argument why people assume that this is just going to come uh, within a couple of years. The, argu the other argument is the concomitant drop in cost. So this is a, a graph that sort of is plotting the cost that it would take uh, to sequence a single, a given base in the genome in U.S. dollars over the past couple of decades compared to Moore's Law, which is the, the increase uh, or the decrease in cost per unit of uh, capacity in the semiconductor industry. And you can see that the cost of sequencing is vastly, it's dropping at a rate that vastly outperforms Moore's Law. And indeed, it would appear, if things continue on this pace, that it'll be possible to sequence the whole genome for a few hundred dollars in, a, few, in a, a series of years. So on the face of it, there's a compelling argument that perhaps this will be coming. But if you look a little bit deeper, uh, we realize that there are a series of challenges that we will need to contend with. And in fact, they may or may not, they may or may not ever uh, bring around whole genome sequencing as a viable me mechanism in, to, in cancer in practice. First, achieving the hundredsfold coverage that I was arguing that is going to be necessary is not standard currently. So one would need to sort of have a mechanism that one could go several hundredfold uh, as opposed to 30-fold. Secondly, doing this in the real world, doing this in archival material is still very much a work in progress. The turnaround time is on, measured on the order of weeks or months. And the data storage and data transfer costs associated with sequencing the genome are not falling as rapidly as the sequencing costs. In fact, they're, they may be going up because you can generate so much sequencing data, it actually costs more and more to store that data. So, uh, w this is really one of the biggest costs uh, and, and could end up being one of the biggest impediments to bringing this about. I'll just briefly uh, make a comment about transcriptome sequencing because some have argued, well, why not just sequence uh, the transcriptome? It's uh, much more tidy. It doesn't require the whole genome. And it allows one to detect uh, point mutations as well as gene fusions and chimeric transcripts, et cetera. But there are also technical concerns here. You have to make a cDNA library out of paraffin. That's not going to be uh, all that straightforward. You can only detect mutations in the most highly expressed genes. Again, we're not going to know about tumor suppressor gene alterations. So just to summarize what I've just been telling you, uh, in terms of the optimal technology, clearly the allele-specific technologies are getting us started, and, that, and that's great. That should proceed. It's also clear that massively parallel sequencing shows considerable promise as a definitive technology. But the widespread application of whole genome sequencing or whole transcriptome sequencing in the clinic in the near term faces both technical challenges, which I just told you about, and conceptual considerations, which I'm about to tell you about. And in particular, one of the conceptual considerations is how do we make clinical decisions using this information? So let me just give an example, uh, a brief example from prostate cancer. So these are two prostate cancer genomes that we sequenced at the Broad Institute over the past year. And what one sees uh, in this, uh, so these are circus plots, which give you kind of a, a bird's eye view of the genome, and, uh, and uh, I'll point out a couple of features in just a second. But the mutation rate, so the overall rate at which you get a one base going to another in these uh, cancers is about one in a million, which leads to about 3,000 base mutations per genome, which then gives you sort of one to three dozen coding substitutions per genome. But you also, uh, as shown by these purple lines and the, and the green uh, hatches here, you also get many rearrangements, over 100, between 100 and 200 rearrangements per genome. So you've got 
thousands of overall mutations, uh, hundreds of coding substitutions and rearrangements. And now the question is, what, how, do we, how do we make sense out of this information in a way that would be clinically actionable? And indeed, when one takes a closer look at the uh, mutations, one sees that most of them are likely to be passenger. There are thousands, probably, of passenger mutations, so they're not consequential biologically to the cancer. Even when you have a coding mutation that changes an amino acid, they're very often in poorly characterized genes, or if you know about the genes, they're, pr they're poorly druggable. They don't tell you what to do. And even in the cases where you see something that looks like a eureka moment, so for example, in one of the prostate cancers I showed you, uh, and I think Jose just asked this question, there's an HSP90 gene mutation. That's pretty exciting. We haven't seen an HSP90 gene mutation in prostate cancer or, or hardly any cancer. So we can dream up, well, this would be a patient who we would give an HSP90 inhibitor to. But that's a fantasy because we don't know what that mutation does. We don't know if it's a gain of function or a loss of function or if it has any consequence to that cancer patient. So all these things, I'm bringing this up because uh, we, can, we can paint a vision uh, of what technology can do, but what we want to do is to be thoughtful and principled about how we're going to apply this in a way that doesn't drown us, but rather uh, is fully enabling. So uh, to kind of uh, therefore summarize uh, what I've just been telling you, we, we have technology that is incredibly powerful in the discovery space. So uh, in, in the discovery space, it's fine to be global and comprehensive, and we don't mind being resource intensive, and we know that we're just generating hypotheses that are going to have to be tested. And, uh, and uh, technologies uh, or uh, activities such as the Cancer Genome Atlas and the ICGC will give us a great catalog. But what we are need to articulate is, is how to constrain that technology that is appropriately targeted and resource efficient and actionable in a way that goes far beyond what we can currently do, but maybe uh, doesn't have to go all the way to uh, global uh, in the near term. So how does one do that? Well, one possibility uh, based on recently published data for how to harness massively parallel sequencing in a more targeted way is enabled by uh, a uh, platform that allows one to design reagents that will pull down the subset of the genome that you really care about. So I'm not going to go through the details of how it's done, but basically you make baits that will be complementary to whatever genes or exons that you might care about in the genome, and with these baits, you hybridize to your uh, target genomic DNA. These baits have biotin. You can, you can pull them down with streptavidin beads. What you pull down goes into the sequencer, and you can sequence much more efficiently uh, in a targeted fashion. And so, of course, for discovery, one uses the whole exome, but we, in terms of thinking about the uh, moving into the clinic, we've been actually playing around with uh, baits that target a much more kind of rarefied set of genes that we think would be enriched, but still reasonably comprehensive in terms of what one wants to read out. And uh, so Nick Wagley, together with Mike Berger in the lab, have come up with one such gene list, which is, uh, consists of 140 cancer genes, as well as several pharmacogenomic loci, uh, and some other uh, targets that we think are of interest for copy number, uh, have designed baits to look at this. And now, the, it's been interesting to apply these in a, a variety of clinical questions that we think are instructive. So this is kind of your canonical signaling diagram, but this is particularly now the, the diagram that is the working mechanism for targeted therapeutics in melanoma, and it shows a couple of points that we've been hearing over and over again. One is that there are multiple genes that we need to read out. So it's not just about one gene. Not just, it's, it's a whole panel, NRAS, BRAF, uh, AKT, et cetera, RTKs. Uh, that are known to be mutated in drivers in melanoma. There are multiple types of mutations to read out. So it's not just the base mutations, it's uh, amplifications uh, of KIT are, are, are seen in acromelanoma, uh, ERB4 mutations, loss of function of P10, loss deletions of P10. So again, it shows, uh, it illustrates how we need a profile platform that will read out uh, multiple genes and multiple types of alterations. And of course, we also understand why it's so important to do this uh, because of the success of uh, RAF inhibitors in the clinic. So with these uh, platforms, so this is an example of a uh, of, uh, of way of viewing uh, using uh, an integrated genome viewer that was developed at the Broad Institute. One can now take, for example, melanoma samples and readily detect the, not only the point mutations, but these small uh, deletions. This is a uh, 21 base pair deletion in kit, which predicts responsiveness to uh, imatinib and nilotinib, and indeed Steve Hody uh, at the Farber showed in a case report, and there's now trials going on that uh, inhibiting kit 
uh, can indeed induce dramatic responses in melanoma. So the ability to read these kinds of things out in a straightforward manner uh, without uh, sort of uh, being uh, hobbled by some of the challenges with uh, conventional methodologies is important. And as Jeff Engelman mentioned, it's not just about reading out at the beginning of the cancer what to use, but also what to use in the setting of relapse. Uh, this is uh, a summary of a study uh, that Jeff mentioned to you where we, uh, with knowledge that came out of in vitro of what kinds of mutations in MEK would occur in the setting of a MEK inhibitor, taking patients who had experienced some degree of transient response to a MEK inhibitor, sequencing deeply into the MEK1 exons, and with this, finding the presence of a mutation that turned out to be present in a post-relapse sample but not in a pretreatment sample, uh, thereby uh, illustrating not only uh, a mechanism of uh, on-target resistance to MEK inhibitors, but also a, uh, 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 the, the importance of using uh, massively parallel sequencing, not just at the beginning where one needs to read out the genetic alterations that might be leading to something that's addictive that could be targeted, but also in principle at the point of relapse so that we can read out at least some subset of the alterations of the type that Jeff mentioned that might be relevant in a whole variety of cancers. Okay. So then the question is, will deep sequencing, i.e. massively parallel sequencing, be successful in the real world? Can we do this in paraffin in the way that we could do with genotyping and some of the earlier generations? So I'm just going to show a, the results of a brief pilot experiment that we're using not just the targeted capture, but also a couple of additional tricks wherein when one is preparing the DNA for the uh, capture, you can append a molecular barcode onto every fragment of DNA that's going to be sequenced so you can know exactly which sample you're sequencing and then you can pool those samples together so that you're sequencing many samples in a single lane as opposed to few and that the number that you pool uh, will drive the cost down proportionally. So uh, Nick Wagley did this with uh, 10 uh, paraffin samples that came out of breast and colorectal cancer. And uh, as you might expect, when you disambiguate the barcode and pool data, not only uh, does one find uh, 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 the uh, point mutations uh, with plenty of depth of coverage, but one can also, uh, interestingly, find uh, examples of copy number alterations. So this is the same platform. You take the exon capture. Because you're counting reads, what you can see is that when you compare uh, a tumor to a normal, this is sort of the distribution of the total number of reads that come down uh, in your capture. But you can see that there's a couple of instances where there are outlier signals, where there's far more reads coming down in the tumor than in the normal. And that corresponds in this particular breast cancer uh, to an FGFR1 amplification. You can actually infer a copy number of that amplification from this information. And there have been some reports suggesting that FGFR1 amplification might predict resistance to endocrine therapy, and there are FGFR inhibitors in the clinic. So th the, the point of this is to show that, in principle, it looks like this can work in the real world. And with the, with the barcoding and pooling, it could be done at a cost point that could be comparable to the genotyping approaches that are uh, in current use. So then there's the issue, uh, and this, this is not going to be thrown out with any, uh, any pretension towards an answer, but the larger question of how are we really going to know if the categorical approach where we take 100 or 200 genes and we read out the spectrum of mutations and we get that back and we use a targeted agent, how are we going to know that doing all that is in fact benefiting patients and in what context is it benefiting patients? What does that mean for how we design clinical trials? And I've heard several people throw out the need for a rethinking in many cases of clinical trial design. But I'm just going to throw up a couple of archetypes of clinical trials, some of which are out there already, but certainly will probably form the basis of how we would think going forward. So one approach is to take your favorite drug. So it's the drug-centered. It's a PI3 kinase inhibitor. And what you're thinking is, I don't care which cancer it is, uh, but I want to give a patient a PI3 kinase inhibitor who has either a PI3 kinase gain-of-function mutation, a P10 deletion, or an RTK amplification a, a one of one of several types, and I want to be able to read out any of those and make a decision to use a PI3 kinase inhibitor. So the notion is you get the profile categorically on every patient, and there may be a whole assortment of genetic alterations that you might use to specify the use of a PI3 kinase inhibitor. So that would be one approach, the drug-centered approach. The other approach that one can think about is more what you can think of as the profile-centered approach, where uh, one reads the profile, one reads out whether or not there's a mutation that might be druggable, and if it's druggable with a certain drug, you give that drug. Uh, if it's a different drug, you're going to give that drug, et cetera. And so you're going to sort of, you're going to bend patients together who have something actionable, and you're going to give them any of a number of drugs, and then you're going to somehow compare them uh, to a group that was treated in a manner agnostic 
to the genetic information, and then one is going to read out endpoints, progression from future survival, total, uh, to, you know, overall survival. Again, these are going to have to be conditioned to particular contexts, maybe even lead cancers, et cetera. But these types of trials, in principle, ought to be uh, the ones that we aspire to because they're going to be truly exciting and maybe will be the holy grail of whether or not this whole uh, fantasy, well, not fantasy, but you know, this whole you know, uh, vision, pie-in-the-sky vision of personalized medicine actually plays out and where it plays out in practice. So just to conclude, uh, it's exciting. There are many opportunities. It's a compelling vision. There are many challenges. I talked about some of the technical and conceptual scientific challenges, but there's also the issue of having the appropriate infrastructure in place from consent all the way to processing samples, interpreting the data, which I mentioned. There's the intellectual property landscape, which actually, if you're reading the news, is it may be the moral winds may be blowing in favor of having a categorical approach in the federal government. But nonetheless, it's, a, it's an important issue to sort out reimbursement and, of course, educating both the physicians and the patients about the judicious use of the fire hose of information that is likely to emerge. So uh, just uh, in conclusion, uh, I'm not sure why I was sort of browsing uh, century-old editions of science, but I, I was doing so for whatever reason. Maybe it was to put a final slide in a talk like this. But uh, uh, there was a, in the very first issue of science ever published, which was back in July of 1880, there was a uh, blurb from Thomas H. Huxley, Huxley, which comes from a larger treatise on science and culture, which is a very interesting read because it's almost prophetic in many ways of what we're dealing with now. But the last line in this blurb says, an industry attains higher stages of its development as its processes become more complicated and refined, and the sciences are dragged in one by one to take their share in the fray. So translational oncology is becoming incredibly complicated with the knowledge and the drugs and the technologies, and yet the, uh, the ability of science to sort of take uh, a seat next to the clinicians and work together is creating incredibly exciting opportunities, and hopefully we'll all live to see the fullness of those benefits in the next several decades. And I'll conclude by pointing out several people uh, who have done this work. Mike Berger and Nick Wagley have done much of the massively parallel sequencing, and Mike also led the prostate cancer genome sequencing. Uh, Carrie Emery, uh, who's not bold, has done the MEC uh, mutation analysis. Many colleagues at the Broad Institute and the Can Center for Cancer Genome Discovery at the Dana-Farber as well. Thank you. Okay, questions? Chris. Levi, explain to me what, or explain to all of us maybe, but particularly to me, what does it mean to be massive and parallel? <laughs> so. Seems like odd words. They do seem like odd words. And I, and I didn't go into the details of how the technology works, but essentially what happens is that the, the DNA, before you sequence, you fragment it so that it's now about 400 or so base pairs in length, and you ligate universal uh, primers onto either end. And then that library now is seeded into a, uh, a flow cell onto which there's a lawn that is uh, sort of complementary, so uh, the, the individual molecules can land, and then there'll be, uh, there'll be clusters that are generated by uh, cycling. And finally, at the end of the day, you have all these clusters that have formed, and you flow in nucleotides. They come onto each cluster. They're imaged. And so it's a sequencing by synthesis. So millions of clusters are being sequenced in parallel. So it's massive because it's millions, and it's parallel because there are clusters of reads that you're kind of reading at once, and you aggregate all that together. And that's why you can sequence deeply, because you're getting millions of independent reads that have come from the input DNA that went into the system. So something that is fascinating is, yeah, I mean, the frequency of mutations, rearrangement, fusions, deletions, in a given tumor is, is as, I mean, the, the, you show these cases in, in, in prostate, and I think this probably applies to everything else. And, and, and yet, you know, um, so there's some debate. So what type of approach do we have to take to identify what's the driver and what's the passenger? Should we take, like, a totally unbiased approach, or should we have biology <coughs> drain into this? I mean, how do we go about that? Because maybe... I'm thinking that this uh, unbiased approach, the same as we did, you know, with um, gene expression profiling, has given us uh, that much. But uh, at the end, um, BRAF being a driver in melanoma is something that has been said for a long time. It made a lot of biological sense. 
So I, I don't know, is there any way to, what I'm asking, is there any way to rationalize uh, this driver versus passenger uh, alteration to make our lives easier? Yeah, it's a great question and uh, it's, it's hotly debated at many of these genome centers. With the catalog of information that's going, that's coming forward, how do we, are there any principles that we can use to say these are more likely or less likely to be drivers. So certainly going beyond the first order frequency based, okay, we see it piling up. If it's recurrent, it must be a driver. There's now a recognition that it may be that even though a given gene is mutated uh, at, at very low frequency by itself, if one looks at members of a pathway or a biological process, uh, there, one can start to add up mutations and see that the process gets mutated in a way that, that if you just looked at single genes, you wouldn't have called them significant. So that may be another way of, as our ability to map the mutations onto biological knowledge grows, to say, okay, maybe this process is required um, and this is another way to get at drivers. But I agree with you that at the end of the day, we need to marry the genomics with uh, systematic functional approaches using, for example, the cell lines, such as have been mentioned, or, you know, other uh, preclinical models that can allow us to both find uh, instances that are tractable where we see these mutations or otherwise model them. Uh, I think there's no way to do it with just the genomic information. Uh, question on the material selections. As you know, the tumors or what the sample is given to you is pretty much heterogeneous from the surgeon's hands or from whoever given to you. So how do you pre-select them before you enter this powerful machine because you put it in something that can spill out billions of information and you have to process them. If you can simplify, simplify the process to pre-select that tissue, so it's a vascular part or tumor parts or mesenchymal matrix, do you have some suggestions on that? I mean, yeah. mostly instructions for clinicians or for surgeons to work with you so to make your job easier as the sample is giving you to be cleaner in some ways. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. You're kind of stuck with the sample that you're given. And uh, so there, so you could be very sophisticated about it or you could be uh, simplistic. I think, you know, what we've seen is that if, it, if, the, if there's a robust amount of tumor and you can just core out the tumor-rich area and you at least know that your tumor material, your tumor cellularity is 50% or greater, you're good um, for a lot of this. Now, as you go down in tumor-specific tumor cellularity, the uh, amount of coverage that you need to get to the bona fide tumor material goes up. So, you know, you kind of have to toggle that. And, you know, you can imagine that with, in collaborative studies with surgeons and pathologists uh, that, that sorting cells and using various markers could be quite useful. Um, but I guess it's from a clinical application standpoint, one wants to think about doing as little of that as possible um, so that you can get this information out, but certainly from the standpoint of discovery and, and understanding uh, the, the extent to which there's heterogeneity that matters, uh, I think these kinds of studies would, would be very useful. I didn't mention also that this obviously, the depth of coverage issue obviously may have applications to characterizing circulating tumor cells, which is something that I think many people are very interested in working out. Thanks, Levi. I think we'll leave it there just in the interest of time.